A sea of the deepest blue, rippling endlessly into the distance like a veil of silk ruffled by the breeze. As if Poseidon had outwitted Zeus and all the gods of Olympus, the sea has now become the very symbol of Greece. The sea with its hundreds of islands. Considered the most beautiful of the Greek islands, the Cyclades, land of myth and legend, also embody 5,000 years of history. Situated in the heart of the Aegean Sea, these islands have been a crossroads for all the movements of civilization that forged Greece and the Mediterranean world. The Cyclades had developed their own civilization as early on as the 3rd millennium BC. Then, around 1800 BC, there was the Achaean invasion. This marked the starting point of Greek antiquity, which culminated with the empire of Alexander the Great. In the 3rd century BC, the Cyclades, like all of the Mediterranean, was under the rule of the Roman Empire. But with the barbarian invasions, the empire was weakened and then broke up, giving birth in 330 AD to the Byzantine Empire with Constantinople as its capital. The Cyclades, a Venetian possession during the Middle Ages, then passed under the control of the Ottoman Empire until the beginning of the 20th century. Piraeus has been Athens' port since the 5th century BC. Galleys, galleasses, nefs, caracks, galleons and schooners, down through the centuries all these ships flying the colors of the successive occupants of Greece made port here. Now instead there are rows upon rows of much more peaceful boats. Ferries, futuristic speedboats, cruise ships, hydroplanes, for all the islands without airports, these boats are the lifelines that keep them connected to Athens and the mainland. During the summer, the boats are swarming with tourists. Their favorite destination, the Cyclades. How will these islands that have managed to preserve their identity in spite of the trials and tribulations of history hold up against this new proliferating species, these modern-day invaders? Before heading for the Cyclades, let's stop in on Athens. The Greek capital is going through considerable changes. Today it's a modern city, proud of its European status. But the past is never far away. Athens still lives in the shadow of the powerful city it was in the 5th century BC, and 2,500 years later, the Parthenon remains a shining symbol of that golden age of Pericles. The cultural influence of Athens was of course bolstered by its military domination. The military strategists knew that to reinforce and spread the supremacy of Athens, they had to control the islands of the Aegean Sea, and the Cyclades in particular. This led to the founding of the Delian League,
the Athenians, when they created, they established the Golden Age and this great uh, empire, let's say, uh, in fear of the Persian invasion, they tried to create the Ionian League so as to uh, have contributions of allies in ships and money. So the Cyclades, during that age, were forced to be the allies of the Athenians, contributing either 460 talents per year or 100 ships. So in this case, the head of the League, who was Athens, would be always ready for fight or for defence. The location of the Cycladic Islands, the so-called Kiklades, in Greek is that of a bridge that connects three continents, Europe, Asia and Africa. And that means that it was always a stopover for fleets coming from the east to the west and vice versa. Far from the bustling activity of the main port, Marina Zea harbors the pleasure boats. The Panorama, an elegant three-master, sets sail for the Cyclades every week. While most of the larger cruise ships make a beeline for Mykonos or Santorini, the stars of the Cyclades, the Panorama prefers to take the scenic route and stop at some of the lesser-known islands of the archipelago. There are a lot of ships going up to the main harbor of Piraeus and coming down leaving Piraeus, passenger ships and, and uh, uh, cargo ships. That means they have to keep a uh, uh, route. So there's separations on here. Before we head for the Cyclades, we're going to call it Aegina, an island in the Saronic Gulf. A dynamic trading center in ancient times and the first city to mint its own coins beginning in the 7th century BC, Aegina is now a peaceful island. Only an hour and a half from Piraeus by ferry, Aegina has become a sort of suburb for well-to-do Athenians seeking to flee the noise and pollution of the capital. It's something of an irony of history when you think that for a few months, Aegina was the first capital of Greece, which had been partly liberated from Ottoman domination in 1828.
In ancient Greece, when each city was a state unto itself, the relations between Aegina and Athens were often hostile. But when there was an outside threat, the two cities became allies. For example, the citizens of Aegina, who were renowned as sailors, played a key role in the defeat of the Persian fleet at the famous Battle of Salamis in 480 BC. Nictarios, like all the inhabitants of Aegina, loves his island. He's proud of the role it played in Greek history. But what he likes best are the narrow streets of the old town and the atmosphere of the fish market. I really love this place. It's pretty, it's friendly, and above all, this taverna has really remained authentic, traditional. It's a place where you get a feeling for the true character, the profound nature of the people of Aegina. Here you meet not only artists and intellectuals, but also everyday people, workers, fishermen, even the butcher comes here. All the neighbors, even the people who come work here in the neighborhood, like the shopkeepers. They all come here to eat. Apart from a fortified tower dating from the Venetian occupation, the city has no vestiges of the Byzantine period. All through the Middle Ages, Aegina, like all the other islands in the Aegean Sea, was raided time and again by the Saracens and later by the Barbary pirates. To escape from these murderous attacks, the inhabitants of Colonna, on the coast, decided to move their city inland to the protection of the mountains. The new city of Paleoora was founded in 896. Winding streets, square houses, a good number of churches and chapels, Paleoora was a magnificent Byzantine city.
For close to 1,000 years, Paliawara was the most important city of Aegina. In spite of its location, it was still attacked by pirates from time to time. The bloodiest raid was in 1537, when Barbarossa attacked the island and took nearly 6,000 prisoners, women and children who were shipped to the east as slaves. We leave Aegina behind us and the panorama heads east towards the Cyclades. After changing course, we pick up a favorable wind, and the panorama, with its sails billowing, cuts through the water towards Delos, our next port of call. The next morning we find that the world has taken on a different color. The sea has gone from blue to gray. Yesterday's bright sun has vanished behind a lowering sky that keeps the outline of the sacred island hidden until the last minute. Delos was inhabited from the second millennium of our era, that is, the Mycenaean age. Around 800 BC, the legend that Delos was the birthplace of Apollo was founded, and it became a holy island. So along with Delphi, Delos was one of the most important religious centers of ancient Greece. Situated in the heart of the Cyclades, which were on a busy sea route during all of antiquity, Delos was destined for greatness. The island's great Hellenic sanctuary became a place of worship not only for the cult of Apollo, but what is quite rare, for the great majority of the Greek gods as well. But what gave Delos its special place in the pages of history was the fact that in ancient Greece, this holy island was home to a host of divinities imported from the four corners of the ancient world. They co-inhabited and gave birth to rather some surprising eclectic blends. There was a big number of people who were born in Delos Many foreigners had been coming to Delos for centuries already, but it was especially from the 2nd century BC on that this phenomenon intensified, and particularly after the victory of the Romans over the Macedonians in 168 BC. 
Thousands of Romans arrived from the West. And at the same time, many different travelers flocked in from the East. Egyptians, Syrians, Phoenicians, but also inhabitants of Palestine and Judea. All these voyagers came from very different worlds, and when they arrived here, they brought with them their customs and their gods. In a way, they invented a sort of place of universal worship, and commercial links were eventually established between all these worlds that met here. So the island of Delos became a hub of exchange, where merchandise from the Orient would transit on its way to the Occident, and vice versa. One of the characteristics of the site of Delos is these houses decorated with mosaics. The mosaics of Pompeii were probably the continuation of the Delos mosaics. These houses were, of course, inhabited by rich merchants, but there were also poor people living in Delos. There was no distinction, no ghettos. The rich lived side by side with the poor. The richest inhabitants had houses built around a patio with a colonnade, and it was here in the center of the colonnade that you find the finest mosaics. Since the island is Arab, there was a water problem. And so, underneath the mosaics, they would dig large cisterns, where they would store rainwater collected during the winter, thanks to a system of gutters on the roof. This system for collecting water was really quite impressive. In spite of the beauty of its houses, Delos is just a small town, and it can't compare with the splendor of the Peloponnesian cities or those of Asia Minor. It owes its riches, firstly, to the presence of the sanctuary, and secondly, to its role as port of call and trading center on the incense and spice route. Towards the end of the first century AD, when the Roman and Syrian traders no longer needed this staging point in the middle of the Aegean Sea, the town and the sanctuary linked in the same fate were gradually forgotten. We continue our voyage to the heart of the Aegean Sea. Once again, the panorama changes course south-southwest heading for the island of Milos. The sun has finally reappeared, and after a few hours of sailing, we're approaching Milos. Compared to the three square kilometers of Delos, it is one of the larger of the Cyclades.
We dock at Adamas, the main port of the island, founded in the 19th century by refugees from Crete. Milos has a number of natural treasures, but the one that really made the island famous is a simple statue of Venus, the famous Venus de Milo, on display at the Louvre Museum. When you think that the goddess still had two arms when she was unearthed by a farmer in 1820, fame really depends on the slightest detail. Not far from the port, Placa, the island's capital, it has managed to retain the charm of the Cycladic towns with its narrow shaded streets and its square whitewashed houses. Like most of the Cycladic islands, Milos is of volcanic origin. Nature's subterranean activities have sculpted some amazing landscapes. They have also left the ground rich with a variety of minerals. During the Neolithic age, the inhabitants realized that they could exploit this mineral wealth. They noticed in particular these black nuggets sticking out of the surface of the rock. This is where the obsidian mines used to be in ancient times. Here, where we're standing, and also in the village of Philokopi, that organized the manufacture of arms, of tools, and even household utensils. The main property of obsidian, which was used to make tools and weapons, is that it is not very hard and can be flaked. It can be shaped to make utensils that are comparable to today's metal plates and nails. We have no way of knowing how much obsidian was produced at Milos. What is sure is that archaeological digs scattered throughout the Mediterranean basin have unearthed millions of obsidian artifacts. They even found large troves of them as far as Gibraltar. Everywhere in the Cyclades that the substrata gives hints of the same mineral wealth, there are mining companies trying to set up business. They started digging mines and working quarries in Santorini and Mykonos, but the expanding tourist trade of those two islands put an end to their projects. Milos wasn't as lucky. Kaolin, Lead, manganese, pozzolana, gypsum. Endlessly the trucks load up and carry away the ores ripped from the bowels of the earth. The mining company has been the island's main employer for many years. The opportunities for employment in the traditional fields of agriculture, livestock and fishing are very limited. What's left is tourism. Meet Yanis. After living more than 20 years in France, he decided to come back to his island of Milos with his family to set up a diving school. It was difficult at the beginning. The island is not well connected by plane or boat, 
so tourism is not a thriving business here. Yet just as a volcanic activity endowed the island with mineral riches, it also sculpted breathtaking landscapes. This island hasn't changed much since I moved back here seven years ago. There's not much tourism, basically because that wasn't the main economic activity here on the island. There are the mines, so people made out all right. The people who were in a position to make money from the mines, the people working in that branch, well, perhaps they discouraged tourism from taking hold on Milos. Now the news is spreading very quickly in Greece, but not yet abroad, that this is a very pretty island. It's true. It's really very nice, very, very beautiful. And there are many Greeks. 80% of Milos tourists are Greeks. The ocean floor is pretty. You know, this is a very volcanic island, so the island floor is quite varied. We have beautiful caves, grottos, hot springs. There are spots on Milos where the water temperature is always 32, 35 degrees, summer and winter alike. Once again, the panorama takes to the sea. We're headed for Folegandros, an island definitely off the beaten tourist track. My opinion is better to go to these not very well-known islands because there are not many tourists there and they are more natural. The people and the area, and uh, they keep the color. And I believe they have not been spoiled with all the tourists. While uh, the well-known islands, Mykonos, Sadorini, they've been spoiled a bit. No planes, a ferry from Athens every other day, Foligandros, population 650, is one of the least accessible islands of the Cyclades. So naturally, it's one of the most authentic. Ora, the main town, perched up on a cliff overlooking the sea and port. The village grew naturally around the Castro, the fortress that dominates Foligandros. Its construction began in the 12th century, during the time of the pirates. 
The fortress was perched up on a cliff to make it inaccessible and to able to hold off the attacks of the Barbary pirates. With time, the village has gone through some modifications and eventually became what you see here today, but basically it hasn't changed. The fortress is still inhabited as it has always been. It's a living place. We are far from Piraeus, about 200 kilometers, and the ferry that does the run between Athens and Syros, the capital of the Cyclades, stops here only three times a week. That's a real problem, but we cope with it. We've got used to it in a way, even though it's hard. Of course, we'd like to see tourism develop here in Foligandros, but we don't want our island to become like Mykonos. We want to keep our identity. These small houses built in the Cycladic style will soon increase the island's tourist capacity. Developing tourism while keeping the traditional activities like farming and herding, that's the challenge facing Foligandros' elected officials. Will they be able to resist the siren songs of property developers of all stripes? Time will tell. But as long as the boat service is so infrequent, they don't have anything to worry about. Our last stop on this voyage to the center of the Aegean Sea, Santorini. A spectacular arrival. We're sailing into the caldera, the crater of a former volcano that is now flooded by the sea. The cliffs that surround us are the vestiges of the ancient crater. The white crown that runs all along the clifftop are the houses of the villages of Oya and Tira, the capital of the island. There were certain periods when the eruptions were particularly violent. The most famous began in 1500 BC because it coincided with the disappearance of the Cycladic civilization. 
There was an eruption in 1925 and an earthquake in 1956, so the 20th century is no exception to the rule. At the beginning of the 1970s, Santorini, banking on the beauty of the site, made an all-out effort to promote tourism. The success has been as spectacular as the landscape. Every summer, nearly one million visitors flock to the edge of the crater to admire the panorama. Up until the end of the 19th century, very little was known about the civilizations of the Aegean Sea. All that began to change with the excavations of the archaeologists Evans at Knossos in Crete and Schliemann in Troy and Mycenae. In Santorini, teams of French then German archaeologists unearthed the site of Akrotiri, which dates back to 1550 BC. If you take a walk through the excavated site of Akrotiri, you'll discover a well-organized city, a city that follows a specific plan. It's as if it were designed and built by a city planner. At Akrotiri, they discovered furniture inside the houses, stone tools, but also pottery and kitchen utensils, like jars that were used to store food. They also found plates and glasses. In addition, they discovered, and this is something unique in the Aegean Sea, wooden baskets. Wood is an organic material, so it decomposes. But thanks to the volcanic ash that buried the site, these organic materials were conserved. But even more surprising than all the everyday objects on display at the Museum of Tira was the discovery of these polychrome frescoes that adorned some of the walls of the houses. As if by magic, the inhabitants of Akrotiri awakened from several thousand years of slumber and come to life before our very eyes. These frescoes are a gold mine of information. They are our only means of learning how people lived at the time. They are tableau of daily life, and they're just full of information. Certain frescoes depict animals, plants. Others show us the architecture. There's even a frieze showing a city that could be Akrotiri. On this fresco, you can also see human figures, men, women and children, with their costumes and jewelry. Simplicity in the forms, bright, lively colors, the frescoes of Akrotiri are quite modern. Another age, but the same simplicity, the same gentle way of life. Here in the small port of Oya, 
a few fishing boats rocked by the whims of the waves. There used to be a thriving maritime activity here at Oya, as there was in all the island's ports. But the advent of steamships at the end of the 19th century brought all that to a halt, and the activity dropped to almost nothing. It's <laughs> There was always a lot of maritime activity in just about all of Santorini, but it was mostly concentrated around Oya. The port was very active with a lot of boats. They would sail all over the Mediterranean and went even as far as the Black Sea. The seamen of Santorini were renowned for their skill. In Oya, the captains were not only mariners, they were the owners of their boats, and they were rich. That's why they call the very fine homes overlooking the city the captain's houses. The ones that weren't rich, like the deckhands, lived at the foot of the cliff facing the caldera. Έμεναν σε άλλες περιοχές όπως είναι από την πλευρά της Καλτέρας, διότι δε, εκείνες τις εποχές δεν ήθελαν να σπαταλούν χώρο για να χτίζουν σπίτια, διότι ήταν πολύτιμος ο χώρος the fields του τάπους για διάφορες καλλιέργειες για να μπορέσουν οι άνθρωποι να ζήσουν στον τόπο τους. The captains were really very rich. They earned a lot of money thanks to the revenue from trade and shipping. But they also loved their island. And so certain families, like the Nomiku family, donated money for the improvement of the town of Oya. That's why the island has so many churches. In Oya, there are 70. Most of them were erected after shipwrecks as a sign of thanks by the sailors that made it home safe and sound. They used to build churches all over the island. In Tirosia, the capital of Santorini, there are 24. That shows how much the inhabitants loved and respected their island. In many ways, the history of Santorini is exemplary. In the third millennium BC, this island, the southernmost of the Cyclades, was home to the oldest civilization of the entire archipelago, the civilization of the idols. From that time on, due to their isolation in the center of the Aegean Sea, the inhabitants of Santorini became excellent navigators. They had active commercial relations with all the other Greek islands of the Aegean Sea, but also with Crete and Egypt. They've even found their traces at the mouth of the Danube, on the shores of the Black Sea, and in Portugal. These discoveries confirm that thousands of years before our era, the Cyclades were already a crossroads between East and West. It was surely their sailing skills and the quality of their boats that saved the population of Santorini from a terrible series of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions that shook the island in the 16th century before our era. 
The eruption of the volcano marked the end of the city of Akrotiri. The city was completely covered in ashes. The houses of the city and the surrounding area completely destroyed. Life came to a halt. The inhabitants of the island fled, but we don't know where they went. This is the accepted theory because when they excavated the site of Akrotiri, they didn't find any human remains. This theory is also reinforced by the fact that we know the city possessed a very powerful fleet, so it's most likely that the inhabitants embarked on all the boats and headed for the open sea, but that they never arrived at their destination due to the violence of the eruption and the tsunami that it triggered. They say that a wave 30 meters high swallowed them up, which put an end to the civilization of Akrotiri. Each island has its legend, whose origin is lost in the mists of time and mythology. The legend of Santorini is fascinating. It was Plato, the Greek philosopher, who first alluded to Santorini when he spoke of a sunken continent, the legendary Atlantis. Scientists and archaeologists have long ago proved that the inhabitants of Santorini were not swallowed up along with their city during the terrible eruption of 1500 BC. But the myth of Atlantis lives on, and Santorini, like the entire archipelago of the Cyclades, blessed by the gods, continues to perpetuate the legend and still stirs the imagination of the voyager.